Thank you very much indeed, Laura. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be able to share a few thoughts about the environmental impact of what we eat. And actually, there's a lot of data coming through at the moment, which at WWF we're processing as part of our new strategic thinking, revealing the real impact of our food system on the environment. And I think actually quite a lot of people are surprised if you ask them what is the main thing that we all do which has the biggest environmental implications. Some people might think it's about the plastic that we're using up. Others might think about their vehicle choice. Others might think about long-distance aeroplane flights. Actually, the biggest single thing is our food and the choices we make in terms of how we feed ourselves. There are many dimensions to this, and I guess most of us in the room would be able to imagine what they are. So one is the physical clearance of land in order to open up territory for agriculture. And across the world, we've all, been seen, uh, we've all seen different pictures of uh, the clearance of tropical rainforests, for example, to make way for soya bean fields or to make way for oil palm plantations. And there is really a huge impact linked to that. Then there's, of course, once land is cleared, the choices we make about the style of agriculture that we adopt. In many parts of the world, this place included here in the UK, we use a lot of agrochemicals in order to protect crops from so-called pests. Pests very often, of course, are wildlife or indeed the food chains upon which the wildlife depends. And so there's a whole set of impacts that follow there. And then the productivity of agriculture that we've seen over recent decades, it's been achieved in large part by large quantities of industrial fertilizers. These escape from the fields and get into water courses, causing immense damage, and then also into coastal waters, in extreme cases, causing so-called dead zones. All of these impacts are linked to our food supply and come with some really big ticket global uh, dimensions. One is a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions coming from all of that. And from the point of view of the natural world, more than 60% of wildlife declines presently attributable to our food system. The others coming from uh, the effects of pollution infrastructure and increasingly from global warming. And the extent to which this is uh, a system which in the end will create feedbacks that are going to affect the food system is seen in a whole range of parallel environmental impacts, including soil damage, the depletion of fresh water, and the loss of pollinating insects. So the idea that this somehow is a trade-off between the environment on the one hand and being able to produce enough food on the other is really a, a, a falsehood. It's a misconception. In the end, the way our food system is developing is actually undermining its own long-term security. The impacts of the way in which we're uh, harnessing the global system to feed people are seen in quite a few different statistics. I'll just share one with you, however, which underlines the extent to which now our um, impacts are way beyond anything that might be regarded as sustainable. And that is the extent to which now air-breathing biomass on Earth is now dominated by humans and their domesticated animals. One estimate, if you go back 10,000 years to the prehistoric period, if you looked at the air-breathing vertebrates on Earth in that period, 0.1% of the total weight of those animals, reptiles, mammals, birds, and uh, amphibians on Earth, that would have been the uh, biomass of people, and their domesticated animals would have been one-tenth of 1%. If you fast forward to the modern era and look at the biomass, which is now people and their domesticated animals, uh, the estimate is that it is in the order of 96%. That sounds like an incredible statistic, doesn't it? 96% of vertebrate air-breathing biomass is now people and their animals. But if you think about it for a second, it doesn't sound so extreme. Even if you go for a walk in the countryside, uh, you will see the odd songbird, you might glimpse the odd rabbit, but mostly what you will see is cattle, pigs, chickens, and uh, sheep and dogs, and of course some people walking with the dogs. So the, prof the impact of what we have done in seizing the productive capacity of the earth in order to feed people is utterly profound. And actually the impact that's coming from the uh, 
Husbandry of livestock, of course, is putting superchargers and multiplying the effect of how we feed ourselves. Because as we've gone along, not only have we produced more and more food to feed people, we've produced more and more food with a higher environmental impact. This has been linked to economic development and, of course, then people having more disposable income going towards foods that previously were luxury kinds of foods and meat and dairy, of course, is very much in that uh, category of higher impact. And if you look at the, the multiplier impact that comes from eating meat-rich diets compared with plant-based diets, it's absolutely huge in terms of the land required, the water required, and the greenhouse gas emissions linked with that. And indeed, one statistic which kind of sums up the situation is how about 40% of the crops that we're producing in the world at the moment are being fed to animals. And some of those crops, of course, are being produced with a very high environmental impact. Our director, Tanya, has just come back from a visit to Brazil, where she's been working with WWF colleagues there, looking at what we might do to help reduce the impact of deforestation in the so-called Cerrado woodlands of the center of Brazil. This is an incredibly biodiverse ecosystem where animals like giant anteaters, anacondas, and jaguars live. It is also one of the most active deforestation fronts in the world today, and that deforestation front is being driven by an expansion of soya beans. Most of those soya beans are being fed to animals in cages across the world, especially in those countries where there is a very uh, high rising demand uh, for meat and dairy-based foods. So, of course, we know that it doesn't have to be like this, and as we heard a moment ago, actually from a human health point of view, never mind the sustainability of wildlife or the sustainability of farming point of view, we know that we can do better. We're eating about twice as much meat as we uh, would healthily consume across the world per capita, so the opportunities for us to drastically reduce the environmental impacts of our food system by moving more towards plant-based diets is absolutely huge, especially as we recognize that we now need to be in the process of restoring wildlife populations and to be dramatically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And today, of all days, with the report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warning of the impacts of going above 1.5 degrees of warming, is a stark reminder within which to uh, have this kind of discussion. And so, as we look at the uh, nexus of issues embedded in here, climate change, wildlife, uh, the, uh, the uh, question of greenhouse gas emissions, what kind of drivers do we need to look at in terms of how we start to steer the ship in a, in a different direction? I pick out just three that I see as being there the whole time in terms of why we go towards the kinds of food policies that we do. So one is about the idea of needing to keep up with demand. So cheap meat is really a response to this idea that demand is endlessly rising, there's more and more people to feed, and so we just have to keep producing more, bringing these kinds of uh, excessive environmental impacts in their wake. Then there's this idea that we need to be uh, keeping food as cheap as possible. It's linked to the same kind of policy choices, but the idea that politicians are in the business of agricultural policies that push prices down is very much what's on their mind as they choose different ways in which to advance the uh, agricultural systems that they can influence. And then, of course, on top of that is this idea of consumer choice. And so if we just unpack some of these a little bit in terms of uh, the idea that we need to keep pace with rising demand. Well, yes, there are more people, but we're going to be able to do that much more sustainably in a much more secure way if we reduce the quantity of meat that's in the mix. So there is actually a need to be adopting policies that take us in that direction for those reasons of rising demand. Then there's the idea of food being uh, cheap and needing to keep prices down. Well, food only looks cheap so long as you exclude all of the impacts that come with the way we're producing it right now. A massive impact on the economics of healthcare in this country with our National Health Service having to deal with some of the issues linked to poor diet, in part linked to unhealthy quantities of meat and dairy consumption. If you start putting that in and the impacts of soil damage, then you start to see actually that the food we're eating is not particularly cheap at all. 
and then look at the issue of consumer choice. Well, yes, there is an issue there about people uh, having some freedom about what they choose uh, to feed themselves with. But if you look around even at public sector organisations and the extent to which vegan and vegetarian menus still sometimes struggle to get a prominent place on the lunch and dinner uh, choices, then you see actually there is an, a great deal more that we can do to be going in this direction. And actually we should be doing that for reasons of public health, never mind the environmental story. So lots of the reasons why we do things as we do them now, they're not really logical, but the good news is that, of course, they can change. We can adapt and come forward with a different kind of agriculture, an agroecological approach uh, it could be described as restoring soils and in the process improving food security whilst helping to deal with questions like climate change. Healthy soils hold carbon in the ground, taking it out of the atmosphere. An opportunity for joined up approaches there in terms of how we approach the sustainability challenge. We can be looking at ways in which we develop agriculture based much more on ecology rather than as now where we throw a lot of chemistry and chemicals at the problem. And if we focused on health and quality rather than quantity, perhaps then we'd get better outcomes for people, not only for the environment. And actually one of the things that perhaps we need to recognise at a very broad level is how the declining indicators of planetary health that we can see all around us, disappearing species, depletion of resources, rising greenhouse gas concentrations, those planetary health signs are going down at the same time as many human health indicators are struggling to go in the right direction. And if you think about it for a few minutes, you see that the most important thing that is linking the environmental and planetary health indicators with the human health indicators is our food system. And that's why at WWF we're now putting so much effort into trying to understand how we can move in a better direction. And I have to say that we're very proud uh, to have been uh, early joiners of the Peas Please initiative, because not only is this for us a question about the production of our food, but also about its consumption, because all of us in the end can make a huge difference to how these trends unfold in the future. And that's probably the... the really good story to be told about our food system because whilst all of us presently are part of the challenge, in the end all of us can be part of the solution, including by reducing our meat and dairy consumption. Thank you very much indeed.